Next up, Phil is actually going to stay on stage with us and uh, he is going to help chair a session with Zach Roberts. Um, Zach and Phil got the call up about 10 days ago. Um, so thank you very much, Lee, to them. They're going to be presenting on Feedbase in Action. Um, Zach is from Dan Darrigan. He runs the livestock side of the business while his brother Jeremy oversees the crop. Um, he's here because of his track record in pushing the system and focusing on productivity. Um, he's got a wide range of soil types, which means that he also has a wide range of species, which have tried, failed, and some have stuck around. Um, but I'm sure we're going to hear about that more. Um, Phil is going to help Zach uh, focus on some of the key changes, how and why they were implemented, um, and the flow-on impacts that, that has had on their uh, on his business. So please welcome Zach. That one is for you. That one is for you. Okay. Let's see if we can make this work, Zach. Do you want to have that one? Yeah, well... You, you have that one. I'm the one who's doing the talking, so... I'm yeah. going to stand here. So we've... Um, Zach's come up with some, um, some great photos and a few of them I had as well of his system. I've known Zach for probably ooh, 15 years or so. Um, and Zach's always had a passion for improving his pastures. Um, he's always been at the forefront of trying new things. Um, and the thing is, he's got four farms spread out over the Dandarrigan Shire, so from Dandarrigan through to Badgengarra, and there's a lot of soil type variability there. So, But the, the, the title that Zach's come up with, which I like, is Managing Variability and Variability in Soils in Climate, because we've had these quite different years and particularly some tough years. So using variable pastures and then varying the way the stock are managed in order to sort of deal with those other three. So, bit of an overview. Um, do you want to quickly yep. touch base on these? Uh, well, yeah, I'm just a, just a farmer from Dandarrigan and like any farmer, I enjoy growing lots of uh, produce and just having fat, healthy animals. So we're at Dandarrigan, which is uh, quite a reliable, used to be reliable um, area, and four blocks, one, you know, a bit drier towards the east, one in Dandarrigan, one in Badgingar, and then a little block by the coast at Durian. So over that area, it is quite variable in um, soil types, climate, and, um, yeah, and just trying to manage those different blocks and being able to, um, you know, shift stock between all of them makes it handy. Uh, a lot of pasture, so 70% pasture. And uh, my brother, he tends to operate the cropping side, which uh, keeps him busy with 3,000 hectares of crop. i uh, got 15,000 breeding ewes, and, which keeps us busy, mainly merino, but about 3,000 is uh, terminals, uh, you know, like a crossbred maternal flock. Uh, two studs to use over that, and we sell, you know, the surplus rams locally and 500 breeding cows. And the soils range from pure white, you know, beach sand through to heavy clay, rock, and, you know, everything in between. So there's big, you know, large valleys with good soil, loams, yeah, to, you know, unarable rocky hills and pure sand, which it does, it's very difficult to manage each of those separately. So let's go on to the sand. So one of the, when I first got to know Zach, um, he'd, he'd come back to the farm and I think he saw these terrible sandy soils and he went, I've got to do something with these. So at that time, um, I was one of the people, um, there was a team of us working on subtropical perennial grasses uh, for that area north of Perth. Um, so Zach was one of the probably, one of the, not the first, but he was sort of one of the earlier adopters and particularly at, at quite large scale. So um, started out with Rhodes grass and then transformed more into Panic and Rhodes grass and now they are more Panic and not much Rhodes and perhaps a little bit of Kai Kuyu. So perhaps just tell us a bit about, you know, how you've gone about, you know, that the, well, you've described it as pretty awful soil. So you had to do some, you know, modification, machinery modification initially to, to get those established. Yeah, normally these paddocks would have, 
you know, you could only graze them for a couple of weeks a year, just, you, you know, Kate, we plant every metre and hardly anything in between. And so the subtropical grasses, I'd seen some people giving it a go and then, yeah, I mean, you get, you can grow a lot of fodder. So we did that, then had all this fodder and then we're quite traditional, back then we were, with a, you know, Anzac Day lambing. So that, you know, there's a big feed resource there that you would um, build a feed wedge and hope for a summer thunderstorm. But even even if you didn't have one, you just lock it up and make sure that you had that bulk of feed for the early for the early lambing. And now I we run twins. All the twin crossbreds are dropped early, and I'd run them in mobs of two hundred, but consistently we would mark one hundred and eighty percent by lambing in you know fodder like that, which. It, even though nutritionally it's not that good, hence you can see the ewes, they, if you don't pull them out quickly after they've lambed, they do go backwards, but the amount of um, – they don't leave the birth site. So, you know, the maternal bond, you're benefiting there. You know, the other paddocks where we don't have perennials, so the good country, we're having to go around with the feeder, you get mismothering, and I can only get, you know, 160 at the most – in a twin mob on that type of country. But here, yeah, you get more lambs. The ewes will be in poor condition, but we normally set up a, a paddock, you know, next to it with an annual pasture that you can quickly shift these ewes once they've lambed onto it so they can regain condition. But, you know, you've gained – your lamb survival is very high. So it, it fits. It's a very good fit for an early drop. So from memory, that would have been a late April, early May photo. Yeah. That was a while ago now when we took that photo. Yeah, that'd be, that's in, yes, mid-May or something yep. would be. Yep. So on that photo, and you've talked about you were traditionally a early lammer, and now you have shifted the time of lambing, but you've done it a little differently to some people with a split joining. So do you want to explain, I suppose, firstly, the reasons for later lambing, but then also how you've made this split joining work? Uh, well, I joined um, – I've been listening to Ed for 15 years or something and nodding my head but not really listening. And then it finally sunk in, you know, this is only a small portion of our land. The rest is normal, so there's no feed in autumn. We're la you know, I just got sick of dead lambs and feed, towing the feed cart around. And with that many stock, it's seven days a week and it was just – you know, you're setting your sheep up, you're doing all the hard work getting them pregnant and then you're losing too many lambs. So, you know, the croppers would never do that. So as a yeah, a sheep producer, why should I do it? So I listened to Ed and finally pushed back lambing. But I still have the crossbreds we lamb early just because I've got that feed resource there. So to utilise it, uh, I just did a 15-day joining to – you know, in the first cycle, you can get about 75 to 80% pregnant. And then with the amount of sheep I have, it, you know, it kind of works out that if I do one cycle, I'll have enough sheep for the amount of perennial grasses we have. So this year, yeah, 15 day mating, got 2,000 ewes um, were pregnant. So they could, there's enough perennial pastures for them to lamb early on. And then the rest, are all remated for a July the 1st drop. Which is when all your merinos lamb. Yep. yep. So the majority will lamb on July the 1st and I'll just have enough for a short um, joining on to fill up the perennial pastures. And once they're lambed, they're off onto, you know, I sow, as you were talking about, I sow um, barley through pastures and to try and get enough early feed so they can quickly shift off and then the leftover grasses for the cows, which will come through, and then they'll carve on there as well. Yes. So it's really just about trying to use all that feed up. Yep. So there's a um, photo of the perennials that are grazed, uh, and in between you can see how white the soil is. It's terrible soil, isn't it, Zach? Um, but what Zach's now done is introduced serradella to grow in between the perennials. And so that's a key part is 
you know, having just a perennial pasture on its own isn't really that sustainable or isn't making use of the winter rain so much when the perennials go more dormant. So, um, yeah, Zach's been quite an early adopter of, of Cerradella. Um, yeah, the feed quality isn't that good, especially for a, a lactating animal. So it's good in maintenance, but as you approach, you know, winter and it starts getting cool, the grasses shut down and then normally – you know, there's nothing growing in between, but now that we've introduced Cerradella, it um it has a delayed germination anyway. So you can graze it really heavily. Once you've used up a lot of the grass, I just lock it up and yeah, all the Cerradella just starts germinating. And then about now, it's probably that height currently. And then um, if you leave it for a little bit longer, you can put the sheep back through and you get quite good weight gains or lock it up for spring and um, there's hardly any annual grasses. You can actually spray them out, so it makes for a good weaning paddock for lambs. Yep. So in terms of Cerradella, the other uh, fit you have for Cerradella is on um, some of your cropping land, and what you've done is combine it with a clear field variety of cereals. I think it was Scopal Spartacus barley to give you the sort of best of both worlds, some, some early feed, um, for the, from the cereal, but then some high quality late spring feed with the with the cerradella. Yeah, so out of a cropping rotation, it'll get uh, sown to cerradella and which margarita and um, uh, I think it's gland yeah gland clover and spartacus barley, which are all resi- um, tolerant to a chemical called spinnaker, which takes out cape weed, which is a major weed that will affect our pastures and all the brome grasses. So as a system, it works quite well. You have two types of legume and the barley and it just grows a phenomenal amount of feed. And then you can hammer it quite – I didn't graze it hard enough there because you you really need to try and take the barley out, otherwise it, you know, outcompetes the legumes. But, um, yeah, you've got options, graze it heavily – and for the later lambing now, they're all on that and you're know, doing really well. And then sometimes you said you've taken the brown grass out and then it becomes a paddock for weaned lambs. Yeah, so now, especially now with the later lambing, that's, you know, I can wean and then, um, you know, we used to have to lamb shear before all the grass seeds yep. got out, which is end of September, but now um, they can just be put all onto these, you know, paddocks and they grow quite quickly. And I don't have to worry about the grass seed, so that's, it's quite a good system. Um, so, in terms of some of the heavier country, I think, like like most of us, you've probably had a few battles with sub clover. Sub clover is a valuable species for you, but you you know you've had red clover disease and had some issues, false breaks. So you have experimented, I think, with um, bicerula and gland clover. They're a bit of a work in progress, I think, still. Uh, yeah, well, with the varying soil types, you know, the Cerradella grows really well on sand and loamy sands, but any heavy country, they get, you know, tend to get waterlogged. Yeah. And by, yeah, I've just been playing around on the edges trying to find, like a sub-clover system is still very good, but we did get hit quite heavily with red clover disease, which took out the whole, took out a whole paddock, so that was a bit of a shock. So really, oh. now I just don't put, we just have, different paddocks, different soil types, and trying to find the best pasture to fit that actual paddock. Yeah. And so one of the things that I think Zach struggles with is occasional waterlogging, and this year would be a classic example, and things like Bicerula don't tolerate uh, waterlogging, and so that's what, you know, some of those heavier soils do get pretty wet in your part of the world. Yeah, this year with the early break, the Bicerula came up, it was looked a million dollars, and one paddock's more free draining, so that's still looking good. Another one... It's all gone yellow and it looks very sick. Yep. So, you know, you're always winning on one hand, losing on the other. <laughs> <laughs> um, now, a traditional part of your system, and it's been in your system for a long time, is a, a standing fodder crop. Um, and I think traditionally on your lighter soils, you've done oats and lupins as a mix. Is that correct? Yep. So all that, the country that now we've put to perennials used to, we just put in a, yeah, a, a mix and, you know, hardly, you wouldn't even really spray it, just low cost, lock it up. And then all the lambs are weaned, put in there, and they'll stay there the whole summer. You'd just get a couple of drafts of lambs out, terminal lambs these are for, um, for meat. Yep. And now 
Yeah, but this year we put in, I had a contract disc seeder. He put in lupins through an old perennial paddock and that's looking really good. And then we've, um, we've just started messing around like everyone else with vetch, which, you know, from the photo, that grows a phenomenal amount of feed and uh, you can fatten quite a few. I had steers and uh, fat lambs in that paddock last year. So that suits the heavier country, yeah. Yep, so it's still oats and um, lupins on the lighter soil as your standing fodder crop. Yep. Yep, yep. And I think that's a key a key part of your system because you're quite, uh, you know, you've got a high percentage of pasture. You do have to have that, you know, you don't have so many stubbles, lupin stubbles probably, you know, so having that standing fodder crop to, to, to get your lambs finished and out the gate, isn't it? Yeah, but, I mean, now... Now we've just recently, you know, the store market for lambs has gone through the roof with the demand from over east. So it's just another variable. So, you know, now we've got the choice. You can just quit them all depending on the season. So this year uh, we'd probably keep them and fatten them because there's so much feed. Yep. But, so, yeah. yeah. And I think that sound from talking to you, it seems like now you've gone to a later time of lambing, you're probably more opening up to the thought of selling store sheep where – Historically, you were, you were a finished lamb producer, weren't you? That was what you did. That was your stock yeah, and trade. Yeah, but now, you know, just to keep your options open, I've already – apparently it's $3.60, so that's that's very high. So, you know, the store price is very good, but I'd say this year that, you know, to fatten them will be also quite luc- lucrative as well. Yep. So uh, this is something that uh, we are working on together, Zach. Um, this is Tudera, which is a, a new perennial legume. So Zach has a 14-hectare paddock, and we talked about PDS projects, and so this, this yeah, is this part is of it. Them. This is yeah, one of them. So there's, um, there's a number in, in the Dandarigan and Mora area, paddocks, and we're monitoring uh, animal production. So you've picked a, a better soil type, it's, it's sort of it's still sandy, but it's a it's a yeah. It's just a red sand. The paddock's actually surrounded by white sand, which will all go into perennials. But this was yeah, just a fourteen hectare little blip of yeah, red sand. A bit you could grow, you know, you could still grow quite a good crop on it, yes. which this tedder is suited to Tedera. Yeah, and so I think that so what when we started this project, we knew that the Tedera. We sort of knew it didn't like white sand, but we weren't 100% sure. So it's gone on a range of soil types, but they tend to be better soil types. It's probably done best at Zach's compared to the other sites, but, but this is a, it's got a looser, deeper soil compared to the other sites. Um, but it is still only early. This was so, and I think it was in June last year. So it's, um, it's a little bit over a year old. And this photo was taken, I think, mid-May. So it didn't get grazed um, in the first year uh, at all and then was grazed. I've got some data here. Um, So it was grazed for 30 days from mid-May to mid-June. So what we did was we um, we split a mob and these were... um, Uh, They're twin-bearing merino hoggets. Yeah, yeah, first lammers. First lammers, so rising two-year-old... so we thought they were quite a responsive class of stock. So we've we've rated those at two DSE each, and so there were twenty eight of those per hectare. So it was I think it was three hundred and eighty nine on the fourteen hectares for a month. It was quite a high stocking rate, um, and they eventually took it down to nothing was left at all. Um, but as you can see, they increased in condition score, they increased in weight, but obviously a lot of that was the two lambs inside them. Um, and they did receive a small amount of supplementation during that 30-day period, but a dollar, a dollar ten worth from from our calculations. Yeah, it Whereas, was just a bale of hay to you know because they were coming off dry feed. And, and it might have been one transition barley feed or something. Yeah. yeah. So it's just a small amount. Whereas the control sheep did what they normally do at that time of year. So they went onto a crop stubble that it was yet to be sown to crop, and that was an old canola paddock, and that had pretty much zero feed in it. Yeah, so they were pretty much fed, you know, as though it was a, a drought was a, lot. Yes, and then they went on to some pasture, which was a bit better at the back end of that. So they did also increase in conditions. So Zach, Zach doesn't, Zach's not afraid of uh, feeding sheep. They also went up in weight, but they, you know, a lot more sup feeding in that 30 day period. Um, so, you know, it's, it's very early days in, in our evaluation of the Tadera, but 
I think we, we, we think the, the, the group is discussing it and we think at this stage that there will be two sort of roles for the Tadera. There's probably lots, but one is this break of season, which is pretty valuable, helping with that um, autumn feed gap. And then the other one that we're really going to target quite heavily is for those July drop lambs when they get weaned, which will be around about October 1, something like that, yep. then this paddock will be spelled and we'll have a huge amount of high quality feed in it. And so we're trying to put on a heap of weight onto those early, early, you know, those wean lambs. Yeah. And plus you can, um, you know, you can spray out the grasses, you can, you know, yes. clean up the paddock. Yep. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's quite exciting actually, but it has to be pretty good soil. So, you know, you're comparing it. I mean, I could have put oats and vetch on that soil, which would have grown a lot. But I'd have to do that every year. So this is a so at once, no real economic use for a whole year as it's establishing. So that's a an opportunity cost. But uh, once it's there, it should be there forever. Yeah. And then yeah, so it is quite exciting for the you know the potential of this species. Yep. So we'll keep you posted through our our PDS project. But um, yeah, it certainly got off to a, a promising start. So some future plans, Zach. Um, you've talked about wanting to increase your stocking rate and, and a lot of that's as you've shifted your, your lambing back. You're getting yeah, so confident now, now that you can, you, know, you can run more sheep. Yeah, and then I, obviously this year's been good. It was a late break where we were, but, you know, it hasn't stopped raining as with everyone else. So it's just getting my head around how many sheep I can run. I'm a bit scared, but... Ed Riggles constantly yeah, telling me to toughen up. <laughs> so so I mean, I'm listening. Yeah, and I, mean, I think part of that is putting in place different elements, isn't it? So, I mean, the next two, I think, I think probably respond to that a bit. So you're talking about putting, doing some more crop grazing, which you haven't done traditionally a lot of. Yeah, yeah, so I'd like to yeah, do that, which would increase the amount of crop, and then I would have more stubbles over summer, which would be quite handy. Yes. So I don't really want to decrease the number of stock, but yep. yeah, increase yep. cropping by crop grazing. Yep. And then containment feeding. Have you done much of that in the past? Uh, this is the second year, but I've just, it's been a bit, um, you know, just small holding paddock, just chuck some grain on the ground. And I had about oh, a couple of thousand in containment. Yep. And it was, yeah, it works quite it's simple. Yep. And are you thinking about setting up? I would like to do a more permanent setup, yep. um, yeah, with proper water and everything. This this was just, I don't know, it was very simple and it worked. So maybe I don't need to go more complicated, but yep. it's definitely something for the future. So I've done it for two years now. Yep. Um, you're keen on some more Ceredella, and I think we've sort of touched on on the use of Ceredella in your system. Hopefully, there's some newer varieties, or there's there's Frano that was released last year, and Hopefully there's another one released next year. So, um, yeah, I think there's definitely scope for more of that in your system, isn't there? Uh, yeah, and I'm constantly learning, you know, dealing quite closely with Angelo Loy, who, you know, the, whenever there's a problem, it's because I've done something silly. One of his golden rules I've broken. So, <laughs> I don't, us farmers are slow learners and, it yeah, you always think that you know better, but... Um, that's what I'm learning, is oh, to, Angelo, to listen. You've been good at contacting Angelo and so, yeah, I think that's, you know, it's a key part is getting that um, getting that support, isn't it, technical support. Yep. And so the Tadera, well, we've touched on that. Um, I, I think on your farm I can see you have a, a number of paddocks of the, of the soil type that looks really good for Tadera. So I think, you know, as we monitor that site, it'll be interesting to see, you know, if the numbers start stacking up, then, then where, you know, where you get to on that front. And they would be, they're more the... Um, good soil but unarable where you can't really get a boom spray in and they're not that suited to cropping. So, you know, hilly or valley country with a lot of trees. So that's where I'd see Tedera would fit quite well on our place. Yep. Good. And I think we've hit our time limit, so we might put it up there. Thanks, Zach. Appreciate it. Thanks, Phil.